I'm Brandon Amoroso, and this is the D2Z Podcast, building and growing your business from a Gen Z perspective. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to D2Z, a podcast about using the Gen Z mindset to grow your business. I'm Gen Z entrepreneur Brandon Amoroso, founder and CEO of Ecom Agency Electric Marketing. Today, I'm talking with Gen Furukawa. He's been in e-commerce for 10 plus years and is the co-founder of Prehook, which is a leading quiz platform for Shopify merchants. Prior to Prehook, Gen was part of the founding team and lead marketing at Jungle Scout, a leading software for Amazon sellers. And he actually also hosts his own marketing podcast, Cart Overflow, where he shares what the best brand operators, agencies, and tech platforms are doing to grow their revenue. So Gen, super excited to have you on. Brandon, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited as well. So before we jump into things, could you just give everybody a, a quick background like on yourself and how you've sort of gotten to this point with uh, Prehook? Yeah, for sure. So um, yeah, Prehook is a, a quiz platform, as you mentioned, um, to help brands accelerate list growth, improve conversion rate by simplifying the buying process, and then capture zero party data. I'm sure we'll get into that, basically help brands learn more about their customers. Um, and it, we started building it, uh, me and my two co-founders. Um, who we met in 2015, as you mentioned, as part of the founding team at Jungle Scout. So uh, Jungle Scout is an Amazon product research tool. And when we first started meeting, it was uh, Jungle Scout was just an extension and we'd uh, about to launch the web app. So we have a lot of experience working together, almost seven years at this point in e-commerce SaaS. Um, and then in 2020, realized that we did want to uh, work together, work something on something of our own, um, and stay in the e-commerce space. Um, but realized that in Shopify, Shopify merchants have some challenges that Amazon merchants don't necessarily have. One of the main problems or challenges is that Shopify merchants don't necessarily know what problem they're solving for. Uh, whereas on Amazon, a listing and therefore the marketing is largely geared towards um, a search query. So Amazon's one of the world's largest search engines. So people are searching very specifically for what they're looking for. Say it's like, you know, a, a blue widget. Um, Shopify merchants have a wider range of inventory in general. And so they don't necessarily know what, what problem they're solving for, what their customers are looking for, and how they can present the best version of their brand to solve their customers' needs. So um, after doing some research, speaking with a lot of merchants, realized that this was, in fact, um, an area where merchants were having issues um, and in some ways were retrofitting tools that weren't meant for the job and, and more specifically Typeform. So Typeform is, is kind of like a, a survey tool, um, but it's not, it's not deeply integrated with say uh, Shopify or Klaviyo or Omnisend or a lot of the tech stack that uh, e-commerce merchants use. So uh, yeah. me and my two co-founders, we started working on it in uh, like mid 2020, uh, right in, kind of like uh, right in the midst of the, the fear of the pandemic uh, and then launched in 2021. And in that time, uh, the landscape certainly changed a lot in terms of uh, the the data and the access that marketers had in order to run their campaigns, the way that they were growing their brands, where, um, you know, iOS 14 and iOS 15 completely ripped away some of the, the data, the, the key targeting metrics uh, that people could spin up campaigns and profitably uh, grow their brand. Uh, so that was, that was a, a huge change where all of a sudden there was an urgency for merchants to say, hey, who are my customers? How do I get in touch with them? And more importantly, almost, what do I get in touch with them about? So that's where we're, we're helping bridge the gap to help merchants learn more about what their customers are looking for, problems they're solving, interests they have, or preferences, mm -hmm. and then um, kind of position and merchandise their product appropriately. Yeah, when we first started the agency, um, everybody was using Typeform, and that was probably, I want to say, like early 2020. And Typeform is really there for surveys, like after an event or something, or just to gather customer feedback. It's not built for, like you said, it's not to integrate with Shopify. But second, it's not built for conversion. Like it's not meant to be pre-purchase, sort of funneling somebody into a set of product recommendations. So um, there obviously was a need for that in the Shopify ecosystem. So I think, I mean, this is a great tool and that zero party data play is something that us as a Clavio lead agency, we're constantly trying to figure out how we can get more zero party data to inform personalization in our email and SMS retention flows. So yeah, I how do you, how do you deal with 
the actual sort of uh, education or nurturing of your merchants who do download the app because it's one thing to say like yeah prehook can help you aggregate zero party data but how do you educate the merchant in terms of for one like why does that even matter what does it mean for me and then how can i leverage it because i see so many sites that have a quiz or have some sort of zero party data play but then they don't actually take it and use it for anything it's more just like it's sitting there and totally it's a, it's a great first step but <laughs> actually have to do something with it yeah i i totally agree and i think that's that's like the biggest challenge like okay there is a problem here is a solution now what you know and then like you're gathering data so what you know like and i think the so what is the the, the critical part um and so the the beauty and i i'm sure you see this um from building out flows it's, it is a lot of work up front the dividends and the, the benefits that you get come down the line and i think the same can be said of a quiz in terms mm -hmm. of like the thought and the strategy you put in up front to like first of all what what data do I need? What data would I actually use? How would I use it? And then how can I actually tactically implement that? Um, so in terms of like, how would I use it? The brands that see the most success with the quiz or with capturing data, um, th they're very thoughtful about how they're um, putting it in front of their customers and kind of like what their mi the mindset of the customers is. So for example, if it is critical at the top of funnel in order for a person to share some insight. And so this could relate to say a subscription e-commerce brand like um, Stitch Fix or Wink, which is recurring wine or mm -hmm. trade coffee, recurring coffee subscriptions. What the customer is looking for is so critical in order to uh, on a recurring basis, send packages or, or send uh, the stuff that a customer is actually looking for. So a quiz is, is a requisite in order to start the customer onboarding. But then there are other brands, uh, like for example, a customer we have is called Tea Elixir, which is an adaptogen brand. So it's like a, a mushroom tea to address different parts of um, improving somebody's health. So whether it is anxiety or sleep or joints, achy joints, um, these are things that uh, the brand needs to understand in order to know what what problem, what health problem they're solving for. Then there's uh, what their their general, like the basics are, their, their lifestyle, their habits, um, and then how they can actually help, you know, to bridge the gap of like what success looks like. Because ultimately as e-commerce marketers, as marketers, our job is to bridge the gap from where somebody currently is, point A to point B, their, their aspirational future self. And the bridge to get there is the brand and the product and the story to help the customer understand that, that that's um, the key to their problems. So yeah, to answer your question, like I think a lot of it is uh, we try to do it in our onboarding flow um, in terms of like educational content um, in, in the product itself. And then for me personally, like I, I'm I try to be as accessible as possible to merchants in order to, um, to build out a jump on calls and help them build out both their quiz flow and then their, their Clavio, OmniSend Attentive, Postscript, mm -hmm. um, some of the subsequent uh, communications, because I think that's where the real value of it uh, is, as you were mentioning, whether that's segmentation or, or you know, the, the flow's dynamic personalization. How important and how much have you invested in integrations with the rest of the Shopify ecosystem? Because yeah. your, I mean, your data is super valuable that you're aggregating, but it's only as valuable as where it's then going to for the merchant to then leverage. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think it, it is critical in the sense that, um, especially for email and SMS, that's where the data is most helpful. So um, we definitely uh, see most of our customers using either Klaviyo or OmniSend. Um, so those were kind of like the, the most important integrations for us to build out. Uh, okay. And then SMS is, is really a, a key channel. And again, the pandemic helped drive this for uh, for driving revenue, for creating a personal relationship with brands to drive engagement and conversion. So um, Attentive and Postscript are uh, what we think are, are kind of like the, the bulk of brands that have a dedicated SMS platform. Um, so we've, we've built out partnerships and a direct tech integration with them. Um, so to answer your question, uh, the data is super important um, and most specifically for email and SMS. Uh, and therefore that's how we've prioritized where we're going to kind of integrate that in the product. Got it. Got it. I think where 
and then for us, like as an agency, it's super important that our tech stack works very cohesively with each other. And so that, I mean, that just makes a ton of sense that you spent the time and invested in, in that. But where, like, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. How much of your development roadmap comes from sort of internal ideation versus customer feedback? And at what point does the customer feedback almost become distracting because maybe you start chasing things that is just for them and doesn't have any broader application? Yeah, that, that is the conundrum of the product manager. Uh, so, you know, my, my two co-founders are developers. I'm a marketer by background and, and uh, for Prehook, it's, uh, it's the three of us. And so I've taken on pretty much everything that's customer facing, whether that's customer success, like the onboarding, the support, the marketing, the outreach, the community stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it, a developer by definition, all of us were limited in bandwidth and resources. So it's super important to prioritize how we're dedicating our resources, our limited resources. Um, and so the way that we build out the roadmap, if we want to kind of get into the nitty gritty of it is basically uh, we use a, a tool, it's called shortcut. Um, and so anything, we'll just create a story like, um, somebody's looking for a custom CSS, like, um, you know, at the moment, that's something that we're prioritizing. We don't have uh, a custom CSS. We'll just drop a story for it. If somebody mm -hmm. else requests it, we'll drop a story for it or just add it, you know, basically a plus one to that story. And then right. as we're moving through it, you know, as we're, you know, our, our to-dos get done, you know, our, our in-progress tasks get done, then we'll kind of like cycle through and look to uh, what's next on the roadmap. And ultimately it's, it's based on how many people have requested it and then also how important it is it to further customer acquisition or um, make the the existing process of our existing customers better um, and so that's kind of like the the thought process that we have and we do try and quantify it um, along those metrics um, and so that's what what we do and um, to answer your question about um, how much is it internally driven versus externally? I think to get the V1 live was basically we, we laid out all the features that we thought were necessary um, in order to validate the product, validate that we were, ha we were addressing customers' needs. And then from there, once we have customers using the product, which we, um, we did when we launched, then, uh, then we could say, okay, now let's help the customers mold the future vision of the product. And so that's where this product road mapping comes in. Got it. Got it. I think um, as we embark on our own path with like building out a, a product, it is something that I'm sort of going through the motions of, of learning and figuring out how to do now because it's completely different than from the agency side where you're taking client feedback, but all of that work is truly custom and there's no software involved whatsoever. It's more about like interpersonal skills and the people versus anything else. Totally. Um, so it's interesting so, to be on the other side as well. Yeah, I mean, I hate to take a, a detour, but I, uh, what, what, what's a product if you're okay sharing? So the uh, company that acquired Electric about five or six weeks ago now, um, right. they are a software company for uh, alcohol, direct to consumer in the United States. There's a whole sort of backstory and history to um, the business and they've got a couple other facets, but the main reason and what we're working on is the launch of a real-time tax and compliance solution for wineries on Shopify. So historically, for one reason or another, wineries, breweries, liquor companies, all of these industries have been underserved by e-commerce technology. It's all second and third tier platforms and providers that um, tried to go and create like Shopify for wine, as opposed mm -hmm. to building on top of Shopify for wine. Because you miss out if you're going with a small like point solution, you miss out on all the platform benefits and the effects of a Shopify. Like there's no pre-hook for wineries on their uh, existing platforms. Everything's custom. Everything is very much so like one-to-one. -one. And so uh, Shopify historically hasn't been able to support these wineries because of how complex the tax and compliance laws are in the US. Each state has their own rules, each county, there's certain restrictions. If you're somewhere, you might only be able to order six bottles in a month versus 24. All of this has to be taken into account. And so uh, sort of phase one of the app that we're launching is real-time tax and compliance in checkout for, uh, for merchants. So cool. 
let's say you're from, well, you are from Texas. So if you're purchasing from Texas, there's going to be certain SKUs that don't even get shown to you because they're not legally allowed to be shipped to your state based off of the licensing structure. And then all the taxes are handled in checkout as well. So um, that's just phase one though. And so now we're working through like, what is phase two? What is phase three? Working with the beta partners, trying to get uh, an aggregate feedback basically starting a Shopify app from the ground up. So it's been I love exciting. It. That, that's fantastic. I, I love that it's so narrow, narrowly targeted in terms of uh, the customer market that you're serving and, and the need is, is definitely there. So that's really cool. Yeah, it's been, it's been interesting. It's not really a sales process because everybody is already super gung-ho on Shopify. It's more so like we just haven't been able to move because we haven't had the tax and compliance solution for Shopify. So mm -hmm. It's usually a pretty quick conversation, which nice. I'm not used That's to We're coming from the agency. It's like there's 180 agencies and they all do the same thing. How do we uh, differentiate ourselves? Um, it's kind of nice being the only one that does something. So. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I will tell you from experience as well. Um, and this is kind of like across the board with SaaS and, and, and most products, e-commerce in general um, is, yeah, if you, you know, you hit, hit success, there are a bunch of people that say, hey, look, you know, like the brand is doing success and being successful with this. And then you kind of like, it becomes more competitive very quickly. And then, you know, there's kind of like feature parity and, and um, prices go down. I, th things become competitive kind of like all around as there is a, a pioneer that establishes that this is a, a viable business model or need. Um, so that, that you're getting out there now, that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm super excited to be able to start to invest in like technology partnerships, do some co-marketing activities. And it's going to be really a watershed moment for an entire industry, which I think is, is, is pretty unique. Yeah. Um, and one that's a pretty cool and fun and has a lot of background and history. Like I think in Austin, there's a lot of breweries, right? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So they all have like their own, their own backstory, usually some sort of like family familial ties. This is very, very interesting. Um, and it's going to be cool to be able to see them start to use modern like e-commerce technology, do things like live selling, do things like quizzes and ask people whether they like white, red, or rosé, like very basic table stake stuff that just hasn't been possible for them in the past. So We'll have to get some some wine merchants on, on totally. Hook. Yeah, we we yeah, absolutely. Food and beverage, uh, basically, you know, and, and I think food and beverage is a great example because it can be a little bit intimidating at times. People might not know what they like or might not know what they don't like, um, and I think that encapsulates the value of a quiz. It's basically just like an in person sales associate. Like if you go to a brewery or a winery. You don't yeah. know, like, you know, maybe what type of grape, but you do know if you do like stone fruit or you like chocolates or nuts or caramel. And so if th there are these heuristics that you can ask. And then so you as a merchant, whether you, you build it out at scale via a quiz or it's just an in-person, you know, sommelier or, or brewmaster, um, you're able to process a lot more and, and simplify the buying process. So in terms of like, the conversion rate optimization, that's that's the main goal if you are a CRO expert, conversion rate optimization expert is simplify the buying process and, and give the buyer confidence, address their anxieties or, or objections and you know make, make the process as easy as possible by saying, here's what we recommend based on your responses um, mm -hmm. and here's why we think it would be good. So it can kind of like bring it full circle, like all the different data points that you're gathering um, and put the, the most relevant part of your story in front of the customer. Do you have a favorite quiz that's currently live that we could share with the, um, the audience? Yeah. So for drinks, um, maybe like joy, J O I add joy.com um, okay. is a good one. Um, I, I think T elixir does a really nice job T E E L I X I R. Um, and so that was the one I mentioned earlier because um, the way that they, the, the use case of um, customers that might not know what they're looking for um, and then making it simple, adding to car. And then the results bear out that they are uh, seeing a lot more um, dollars conversion rate um, and dollar per uh, email recipient than mm -hmm. those that don't take the quiz. Um, Got it. I, I found joy here. I'll definitely, I'll, I'll drop that in so that people can, can check it out. I love how uh, various 
specific, I can already tell, like from the very first question, what diets do you associate with like vegan, vegetarian, keto, paleo, dairy free? Yeah, that question in and of itself could just dictate the rest of your communication with that uh, with that customer, because if you select vegan that I mean, you're only going to send vegan products, I hope. Totally. <laughs> so it, that, that's uh, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right. Um, and then also, let me I can share the uh, I'll just drop it in the Zoom chat. Um, spike ball. I know, you know, Gen Z, that's like you know, the sport. Um, so we have uh, Spike Ball is a, a customer and uh, they have a quiz. So Spike Ball is kind of like a, a relatively newer sport, but for four people or two people. So like, how are you going to use the game? How, how advanced are you? Are you interested in joining the community as in like basically finding players around you? Are you interested in learning more? Do you want to um, be in communication via SMS? Like these are things that are really um, helpful for Spike Ball because they, they have so many different uh, products or ways that they can uh, share the, the the content that they're putting out because they have a fantastic media arm. Um, so I think that that's also a really cool example, uh, especially for your target demographic. Yeah, definitely. I think for for us with our sort of Gen Z spin, it's all about experience based marketing and not so much like direct response, like shop now, discount, 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 mm -hmm. whatever it may be. There's a little bit more storytelling. It's more about the, the brand, like ethos and values and everything that goes into that. And I think the best way to make it um, obvious that you care about your customers is to do things like a quiz or do a post-purchase survey and then use that to better inform the, the customer journey. I think the easiest way to do it too is to think about how would I like my experience to be personalized. And then once you understand what you want to personalize the experience to be, then you can back out from there. Like these are the data points that I need to get in order to do so, which then would inform the questions versus sometimes it feels like the brands come up with the questions first and then don't have necessarily um, the plan for how they're going to take those questions and put them into action. Yeah, that, that's really important, especially if you are say running paid ads. So a quiz is great for like a paid ad, just because it plays to the curiosity hook that um, ads are relying on like, Hey, help me learn more about myself or um, what, what can I discover that I don't already know? Um, and, uh, you know, as humans, we always want to learn more. We're always on this pursuit of, of uh, learning more about ourselves. And um, so, yeah, the, the, the hook can be great there. Um, and you don't want to just waste money by asking questions that are irrelevant. You know, like, like you were saying, if you come up with the questions first, um, because if you don't use it, every question you are uh, increasing the likelihood of a drop-off. And if you're spending money to get people to take the quiz, um, I mean, that's just money down the drain. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, for me, the biggest thing when it comes to the quiz is to keep it short and sweet. Otherwise, if you have 15 questions i mean there's going to be drop off and, and you can see that like with the analytics too and it's just important to make sure that people are at least going to get to those product recommendation results but you yeah. have this weird like human psychology where maybe if i make the quiz 20 questions long it feels like it's actually giving me a personalized recommendation whereas if it's a three question quiz it feels maybe like it's just the gimmicky marketing thing that's going on yeah, um, so I think there's there's probably a, a balance somewhere in the middle. The the thing that drives me crazy is not every question has to inform the results page because if you have like ten questions and all that ridiculous conditional logic built out to showcase different products, maintaining that and understanding the different paths to get there, extraordinarily complex. I prefer to just pick two maybe three questions that actually impact the results page. And you can still ask the other questions because you want to get that zero party data for your email and SMS personalization, but you don't have to have all 10 questions impact the, the results page. Totally. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And you were asking about quizzes that I like earlier. Uh, it's not a quiz. It's not a pre-hill quiz. Um, I think it's a custom quiz is Helix Sleep. Um, Helix okay. is a mattress brand. Um, and the quiz is kind of like at the centerpiece of their marketing strategy. Um, 
because a mattress is expensive and, and you're buying one every like 10 years or so. So it's not going to be an impulse, you know, like let's just land there from a, a search ad and then purchase. Um, there's kind of like far more of a nurturing process, uh, but also there aren't a lot of SKUs. So they ask five questions, you know, basics, like who you're buying for, how many people will be sleeping on it, what's their, their gender, their height, their weight. Um, and then more specifically, uh, as the quiz progresses, like side, back, front sleeper or, or any pains. Um, so there are five questions total, pretty easy to get through. Then there's a recommended product at the end. And, um, and then from there, that's where like, okay, now they, they know a lot about it. Um, but like you were saying, it's not like a skew of crazy, um, a, a lot of potential answers at the end. There's just, you know, yeah. how many mattresses they have, but uh, the, the marking subsequent to the quiz is very granular to um, based on what I shared in the quiz. One, one of my favorite questions is the, who are you buying for? Cause if it's yeah. not yourself, then like immediately sending an email and text after the purchase being like, well, why don't you buy for yourself now? As opposed to just getting a gift. Um, so that that's, that's by far one of my favorite little, I guess, hacks into some additional revenue. I don't think it would work as well if a mattress, but if it's a consumable product, it's a bit easier to totally. Uh, and then also, you know, purchase. like, yeah, sorry. We, uh, I did have one merchant tell me that, uh, they found out that for gift buyers to shorten the, uh, the welcome flow, the, the post quiz welcome flow, uh, has increased their or decreased their subscription unsubscribe rate. So basically shortening the flow for gift buyers has reduced unsubscribes. Um, and it, it makes sense. It's more of a transactional thing. Um, so that's one thing, uh, that you can do if, um, you know, it's a gift buyer versus buying for themselves, but then also if there are holidays coming up, mother's day, father's day, uh, you know, Christmas or, or the holiday season, um, also a great time to create a segment of gift purchasers, uh, cause a gift might not be a one-time purchase, but um, for a loved one, you, you, there are lots of opportunities to buy gifts for them. Yeah. So I just have one final question before we wrap things up here, because we've been talking a lot about the actual tactical like deployment of quizzes, but you obviously have a team that is behind this app and the success of it to this point thus far. So could you walk me through a little bit how you came up with the founding team? If it was sort of a uh, hand chosen or if you all sort of fell into it and then what sort of things have you done in order to scale out the team and make sure that you still have a cultural uniformity and that everybody is still tracking towards the end goal whatever that may be for you and your business yeah great question thank you uh, so it is it's me and my two co-founders as Diedrich and um, like I was saying earlier they're both developers and so they've been handling the product. I've been doing the marketing and everything else. Um, and so we, we met kind of like as coworkers uh, in mm -hmm. 2015 and had a lot of experience working together. And I think that's kind of like, obviously one of the things that you can't force or, and, and um, kind of like requires time to bear out, but this level of trust and familiarity and alignment um, to, to have some of the conversations that um, are critically important, but some people might want to gloss over, like say, for example, what if, you know, circumstances arise all the time, people's interests move on. What if this happens or um, how would we deal with say equity or um, so just kind of like the, the things that if you deal with a bigger company are in paper and writing, but we had to just kind of like create this on the fly. Um, and I think if we have the underlying trust and um, familiarity over time, those are easier to have like, Hey, we don't expect these, uh, bad circumstances to arise, but we have to pr prepare for the worst. So let's get it all down in writing. And, and so I think we we're okay with that, um, which is great. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that that's helpful in identifying what the, the future, uh, of everything looks like. And, and we are all equal in this. And so I think we, we each have uh, a voice that we respect and we're happy to share and put out there. Um, and in terms of growth, uh, yeah, I'm looking for uh, people. I've been doing a lot of it myself and and now we're at the point like, okay, that, that doesn't work and that doesn't scale. And I want to find ways to, uh, to not only like move back, but also to, to kind of like empower one, one, two, three people um, to take the role and, you know, have ownership as if uh, it were me or have that same feeling that that I have. Um, and so I, I'm still trying to figure it out for pre-hook. Um, 
but I did, you know, I, I did have this experience, you know, growing the uh, marketing team at Jungle Scout um, from basically, you know, it was, it was me. I took it from the CEO founder, um, Greg Mercer. And, and um, from there, when I left, I think the marketing team was like 25. So I, I had that experience of like growing yeah. it. And, and I think that's, that's a lot of people. It is. It is. And um, a couple, a couple of things is, it, I think, like allowing people the autonomy and ownership to kind of like give them the strategy, give them the high level goals. You know, we were with, mm -hmm. working with an OKR system, which is objective key results, objectives and key results. Um, and then from there, like, all right, it's up to you to figure out the path of how we get there. Happy to be a resource and uh, have open dialogue on that, but um, to allow them to figure out the, how to get from, you know, where we are to where we want to go. Um, and I think that that's really critically important to empower people and, and give them ownership and um, make them feel invested in the role. Yeah, I think not only is empowerment and ownership very important for um, the team member in terms of making them feel like they have a say in things, but they actually, I mean, they should. That's when we've been able to do our best work and why we've gotten to this point is because we have so many great ideas coming from the team in terms of how they could improve electric, but those ideas wouldn't even surface or come to the table if they didn't feel like it was theirs and they were empowered to bring these ideas to light and then actually know that they have the latitude to take that and own it and bring it to actual like execution stage is really something that I think is important for, for any business because you don't want to hire somebody just to give them a checklist of things like this is what you do and this is all you do. It, it couldn't be more of a waste of everybody's time. Yeah. You should be hiring smart people to bring smart ideas to improve whatever business that you're working on. Exactly. Exactly. And, and then, you know, the, the, to kind of close the loop, then you ideally you want to help recognize and, and give credit uh, publicly to, uh, to them. And, and that kind of um, incentivizes further initiatives and, and uh, speaking out and taking ownership of things. So um, yeah, I, I think, recognizing and giving credit is also critical to like, Hey, you're, you're being motivated intrinsically. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Well, Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Um, can you just let everybody know where people can find you online? Yeah, totally. Um, thanks for having me, Brandon. Uh, so yeah, again, um, you can find me again through Kawa, uh, on LinkedIn or Twitter. Um, and feel free to email me again, G E N at prehook.com. I uh, would love to share thoughts, feedback, whatever on if you, you know, capturing zero party data, considering a quiz, happy to share, um, anything that I've learned specifically for whatever store or niche you're in. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for joining us, everyone. As always, this is Brandon Amoroso. You can find me at brandonamoroso.com or electricmarketing.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.